and I will introduce our, our two debaters here in just a moment. Um, my name is John Speed. I'm pastor of Christ is King Baptist Church, and thank you all for coming out today to, to see this debate. I want to give you the rundown on the format, what we're going to do. Uh, each side will have 12 minutes for their opening statements, and then 10 minutes each for cross-examination, six minutes each for the rebuttal, and then six minutes each for the summation. Uh, you all got a index card, hopefully, when you came in. Everybody get one, anybody not get one? Okay, you got somebody here that needs one, we'll get you hooked up. And that's to write down questions on. Um, as you get those questions written down, you'd like to ask a question, just pass that index card. I'll be sitting right up here in the front seat, and uh, we'll go through as many of those as we can in the last section of a 30-minute Q&A. Each side will have two minutes to respond to each question. So we'll get through those, as many of those as we can. Can't promise that we'll get them all but we'll do the best that we can. Bathrooms are right out the door there in the hallway. Um, our speakers have a table up here with some information. I'll let them explain what's there. And uh, with no further ado, we'll introduce our speakers. Uh, Dan Courtney is an outspoken atheist and president of the Free Thinkers of Upstate New York. Dan writes an online column for examiner.com under the heading of Rochester Atheist Examiner and engages theists in a number of formats in an attempt to foster mutual understanding and the advancement of knowledge. Dan is a graduate from Clarkson University and currently lives with his fiance in Hilton, New York. And over on the far side here, we have a Canadian apologist, Cy Ten Bruggenke, was raised in a Christian home in Toronto, Ontario. And since 2005, he has been teaching a Christian apologetic which presents God as the foundation for everything, even the ability to reason. Sai teaches Christians how to present Jehovah God to atheists and has proved his faith in spirited debates. His credentials include being a dude with a website and he lives in London, Ontario. So we're, let's give him all, give him a hand for um, And with no further ado, we're going to begin um, now. Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank all of you for coming here to hear Dan and I debate a very important topic today. I want to thank Dan for agreeing to debate me, and I want to thank John and those who helped him set up this afternoon's event. Most of all, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for allowing this debate to take place. I'd like to start off by telling you that I don't care who wins this debate this afternoon. What is important here is not who wins this debate, but where each of us will spend eternity. Sadly, there are some in this room who deny the existence of God and are headed for hell. Not for denying him, but for their sin against him. I know the reaction. I don't believe in God and I'm not a sinner. What do many Christians do when they hear that? Well, why don't you believe in God? And the typical answer, not enough evidence. If you could give me evidence for the existence of God, then I believe. But folks, I'm here to tell you that evidence is not the issue. In fact, when I asked atheists if I could give them enough evidence to believe in God, would they worship him? And typically, they say no. But what do most Christians do? They give evidence anyways. Now folks, where do you hear the term evidence most, most often in the secular world? In court, right? Who do you give evidence to in court? The judge and jury. If I were to give evidence to you for the existence of God, then I'd be saying that you were the judge over God. Now that's not to say that there is no evidence for God, but presenting it to you would be putting you in the judge's seat. Even if I won the case, you'd still be the judge. But folks, any God that we are the judge over is not God. The fact is that scripture teaches that the existence of God is so obvious that we're without excuse for denying him, and that everyone knows that God exists, and that those who deny him are merely suppressing the truth. 
Now, I realize that people will take offense to that. But I'm not saying that I can read your minds. I have, thankfully, no idea what's going on in there. I'm just telling what God's Word says about you. You see, it's not the brilliant philosopher who says there is no God. It's not the scholarly scientist who says there is no God. According to Psalm 14.1, it's the fool that says in his heart, there is no God. So then why even debate, right? Why not just stand up here today and say, God exists and you know it? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. But I'm not only going to tell you that, I'm going to demonstrate it as well. Now, what if the debate this afternoon was on the existence of words? I took the affirmative and Dan took the negative. What if Dan stood up here this afternoon and said, I don't believe in words. I'm not saying that there aren't any words, just that there's no rational foundation for believing in words. What if he called himself an A-wordist? Not a strong A-wordist, mind you. He's not saying that there's definitely no words. For all he knows, there may be words orbiting the sun somewhere between the Earth and Mars. But if there were, it'd be up to me to prove it to him. What would you think? <coughs> you think he was nuts. You think he was a fool. Why? Because in order to make his objection to the existence of words, he'd be using them. He'd be assuming that words exist in order to deny the existence of words, conceding the debate. Now this afternoon, our debate topic is not whether or not words exist. It's on the existence of God. Just so there's no confusion, I'm defending the existence of the only God that exists, the God of Christianity. Folks, I submit that denying the existence of God is even more foolish than denying the existence of words. Now why is that? The Bible teaches us that from God, through God, and to God are all things, Romans 11, 36. Not just words, but all things, everything. Now what does that mean? Basically, that everything is dependent on God. I mean, that is the kind of God that we'd expect, wouldn't it be? A God who is Lord of all creation, a God that was inescapable, not some far off, ne far off nebulous being that needed me to prove him to you. Not some being that our puny brains would have to reason to, but the almighty God, the creator of the universe, that we could not reason without. God is not a God that we can reason to, but he is the God that we can't reason without. Now let me give you an example. You see, we're all gathered here for a debate. Debating presupposes many things, but one of them is that we can know things to be true. Without knowledge, you can't have debates. And without God, you can't have knowledge. Just like you need words to be able to speak, you need God to be able to know, to have knowledge, to have justified true belief. But why is that? Well, let's take, a, let's take a look at a typical knowledge claim. Let's pick something generic. I know A. What's the next question? How do you know A? Well, I know A because of B. Well, how do you know B? I know B because of C. How do you know C? I know C because of D. How do you know D? Because of A, because of E, because of F, because of G, because of H. Do you know where that ends? Not at the end of the alphabet. It doesn't end. It's an infinite regress. It's an infinite regress of, and how do you know that? You see, in order to stop that infinite regress, you have to know everything. Or, have a revelation from someone that does. Well, who knows everything? Who knows everything? God. God knows everything. Now, what's the Christian claim to knowledge? We know things by and through revelation from God who knows everything. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Basically, in order to know anything, you need to start with God. Now, if my opponent was intellectually honest, and I hope that he is, he would be forced to concede that an all-knowing, all-powerful being could reveal some things to us such that we can know them for certain. God could give us knowledge. The question becomes, though, how does he know anything? How does Dan escape that infinite regress? Quite simply, he can't. Now, what do many atheists do when I point that out, that they can't know anything without God? They often say, okay, I can't know anything, but either can you. 
To which I reply, if you can't know anything, how can you know what I can know? You see, they deny knowledge, and the very first thing out of their mouth is a knowledge claim. Now, damn, I just say, okay, I don't know anything, and stop right there. Well, what's wrong with that? To say that you don't know anything is to make a knowledge claim. You're basically saying, I know that I don't know anything, which is self-refuting. So to recap, debates assume knowledge, and knowledge assumes God. Just as speaking exposes a pre-commitment to words, debating exposes a pre-commitment to, uh, to knowledge, and knowledge exposes a pre-commitment to God. By showing up here today, Dan presupposed knowledge, and in so doing, exposed his pre-commitment to God. Just by showing up today, Dan lost the debate. The proof that God exists is that without him you couldn't know anything. Now, I'm not saying that Dan doesn't know anything, but that he exposes his pre-commitment to God with every knowledge claim he makes. And he will make knowledge claims. Now, I don't give that proof with the expectation that Dan or any of you will accept it. Proof does not equal persuasion. But if Dan wishes to refute my proof, he will have to demonstrate how he can know anything apart from God. If Dan, on the other hand, wishes to deny knowledge, then this debate is over. You see, without knowledge, debates do not make sense. And without knowledge, Dan will have no foundation to challenge any of my claims. Without knowledge, Dan can't know what's real. Without knowledge, he can't know what's right. He can't know what's true. Without knowledge, Dan can't know that there's no rational foundation for belief in God. Now, I want to make it perfectly clear. I'm not saying that God exists because Dan can't account for knowledge. That would be fallacious. That would be an argument from ignorance. It would be like saying, well, Dan can't prove that the moon is not made of green cheese, therefore it is. Again, that's not what I'm saying. My claim is that God has revealed himself to everyone, such that we know for certain that he exists, and that is evidenced by anyone's knowledge claim. That's it? Yep, that's it. God exists because he told us so. And I submit that Dan has zero basis for knowledge, and therefore has zero basis to object to that claim. Thank you very much. afternoon. Thank you, John, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, for spending your afternoon, especially on such a beautiful day outside. First, I just want to point out that I'm actually at a bit of a disadvantage coming into this debate for a couple of reasons. First, it was just over a month ago that I first heard the term presuppositional apologetics, so I'm sure I'm going to step on a few landmines, and I'm just as sure Sai is going to be happy to point them out. <laughs> and second, I have just a regular, ordinary Irish name, but Sai can prove okay, that's pretty cool. So, what better way for an atheist to start his argument than a couple of quotes from Scripture? It's Proverbs 1.7 that tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And Romans 7.25 tells us, I myself and my mind am a slave to God's law. Now, most atheists will just discard such Bible quotes without recognizing the flower of truth within them. And many Christians will insist that such poetry must be accepted literally and in its totality. But what these verses are pointing to, and what atheists and Christians can agree upon, is that we can ground our reason to advance knowledge. Now, whether you believe, as I do, that God is a metaphor for the nature of existence, or you believe as a personal being, what these writers recognized was the need to acknowledge their intuitive understanding. Does that mean I've given up my atheism? No, because I can agree with Sai that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, although I may quibble with the fear part, maybe reverence or simply understanding would suffice, but what I don't need to agree with is all of the other baggage 
that's often piled on the term God. Now, Sai tells us that God is a necessary presupposition, an undeniable truth upon which knowledge itself is founded. Okay, I'm good with the core of that premise because both the biblical authors and Sai are on to something important. I don't need to think that either, either were or are off their rockers to make such claims. No, because these are perfectly reasonable claims, provided you can answer an important question. And that question is not, does God exist? The question is, what is God? Well, so far we, we can say, excuse me, so what can we reasonably say about the underlying truth of the phrase, the Lord is the beginning of knowledge? Well, we can say it contains profound insight, especially for being written some 600 years before Aristotle, who is generally credited with being the first to formalize the study of logic. And the author of Proverbs, and it's said to be King Solomon, who lived some 3,000 years ago, was no dummy. He had the same sense of a foundation of knowledge that Aristotle later organized and described in more detail. Now, Aristotle called it analytics. We call it logic. King Solomon and Sai prefer the term God. Like I said, I'm okay with that, but I am afraid that using the term God may be unnecessarily confusing. In fact, I think confusion is exactly what Sai is counting on. You see, Sai is trying to sneak in 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. Or maybe a better analogy is he's offering a Trojan horse, a gift with a little extra. So while you're scratching your head and eyeing this gift left outside your gate, what you may not realize is Sai has loaded up this gift with lots of extra stuff that's not only unnecessary, it's completely unjustified. I'll explain why, but let's get a few definitions out of the way first. An axiom. It's a statement accepted as true as the basis for argument or inference. Logic, the science, the formal principles of reasoning. Knowledge, justified true belief. And the law of parsimony, also known as Occam's razor, a scientific and philosophic rule the entity should not be multiplied unnecessarily. Now this law is generally interpreted as meaning the simplest of competing theories should be preferred. Now it was the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein that said, quote, if I have exhausted the justifications, I have reached bedrock and my spade is turned, then I am inclined to say, this is simply what I do. The bedrock that Wittgenstein is referring to are the axioms the foundation, the base assumptions from which everything else is built. Aristotle described them as self-evident, although I prefer, prefer to consider them as necessary truths or that which cannot be false. For example, I exist. Now the opposite of I exist is I do not exist. But the statement I do not exist is self-refuting because it presumes the I in the statement itself. Therefore, the proposition that I exist is a necessary truth and cannot be false. Now, this may seem silly, but Solomon, Aristotle, Descartes, Russell, Wittgenstein, all the great philosophers wrestled over exactly where the bedrock was located. Now, here are some examples of axioms from classical logic. Non-contradiction. Something cannot be A and not A in the same manner at the same time. Excluded middle. A statement cannot be both true and false in the same manner at the same time and identity, an object is the same as itself. Again, this may seem obvious, but we need to understand these core principles, lest we be like the foolish man of Matthew 7.26 who, quote, built his house upon the sand. These foundations of logic may also seem silly because we have an intuitive understanding of these principles, and it's that intuitive understanding, that common experience that something cannot be A and not A, for example, that the Bible authors are, in part, speaking to. If we want our house, our understanding of reality, to have a solid foundation, then we need all of our knowledge claims to trace back to the fewest, most basic assumptions possible. Why? Because it works. It's called the law of parsimony, or Occam's razor. Experience has shown us that fewer assumptions is generally more reliable than more assumptions. So, if I use the term God, I'm simply using a metaphor to represent the axioms that are foundational to all knowledge. And in accordance with the law of parsimony, I would consider this God to be only the most fundamental 
the most basic necessary truths possible. Now, these axioms have something else in common with most notions of God. That is, they're immaterial, spaceless, and timeless. In other words, they exist, but they're not physical. They exist everywhere. They have always existed, and they will exist forever. In other words, they are transcendent. So, so far, we've shown that the term God can be a metaphor for the necessary truths upon which knowledge is built. But what, by our definition, God is not, is all of the other non-axiomatic attributes commonly identified with the Christian God. The extra stuff, if you would, that Psy presupposes. The very attributes that are necessary to take that flower of truth in Proverbs to the full-fledged God of Christianity. Here are a few. Personal powerful, intelligent, moral creator. Now take the attribute powerful example, for example. Is a powerful God an axiom? Well, the opposite is God is not powerful. Was well, this possible? Of course. So God is powerful is not a necessary truth. But you may say, but God has to be powerful, otherwise he could not have created the universe. But without ever getting into whether or not this is true, the statement itself demonstrates that powerful is not an axiom. It's not an axiom because you are now trying to justify powerful with another attribute, in this case, creator. Remember what Wittgenstein said, if I have exhausted the justifications, I have reached bedrock. Clearly the justifications for powerful had not been exhausted, and the same can be said for the other attributes. But it gets worse because this limited list of attributes could apply to any number of gods. The Hindu god, Vishvakarma, the Muslim god, Allah, the Mongolian god, Bai Ulgin, and many others. To get to the Christian god, we need to add even more attributes. Incomprehensible, true, holy, good, self-regulating will, source of life, trinity, impassable, simple, self-existent, just, love, gracious, merciful, sovereign, freedom, and jealous. <clears throat> Are all of these axioms? What if God wasn't good? Does that mean that reason would fail? What about jealous? Would an unjealous God destroy the foundation of logic? No, these are knowledge claims that need to be justified. They're clearly not axioms, they're not self-evident, and they're definitely not necessary truths. The problem is that these attributes are the soldiers hiding inside the Trojan horse. But that's just exactly what Sy's presuppositional argument is all about. He claims as an axiom that Christian God in the Bible is his revealed word. He wants to avoid having to justify a long list of unjustifiable, unjustifiable attributes by hiding them inside God and pushing it through the gates. Only later, if you're lucky, do you realize that you've been duped. Okay, let's recap my position. Yes, there are necessary truths, and yes, some have referred to these truths as God. But no, the Christian God, with all the attributes necessary to differentiate it from the many other conceptions of God, is not an axiom, and therefore presupposing such a God is not justified. Finally, I have one more analogy for what Sai is doing here this afternoon. He's engaging in a kind of intellectual sleight of hand, and I'm going to let you in on the trick. Back to Wittgenstein one more time. If I have exhausted the justifications, I have reached bedrock. Although our axioms are necessary truths, strictly speaking, they have no external justification. What Sai does is repeatedly ask, how do you know, in lots of different ways. Now, it sounds reasonable until you realize that Sai's definition of knowledge, as is mine, is justified true belief. So when he asks, how do you know your axioms are true, he's asking for justification for something that, by definition, doesn't have an external justification. He completes the maneuver by claiming that God has revealed things to him such that he can know them for certain, while at the same time claiming God as an axiom, which requires no justification. Very slick, but if you listen carefully, you'll be able to spot the deception.
10 minutes each for cross-examination. So I assume we're starting with Sai. Sure. Yeah. Great. All right, Dan. I have, I think, 38 questions written down. We've got 10 minutes, so we'll see how we do. Okay. Is it possible that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know? Well, first we have to distinguish between knowledge and the axioms that I talked about. Right. That's why I brought my handy dandy visual aid right here. This, this rock actually represents the axioms, those, the bedrock uh, that I talked about. And the knowledge is our house that, if you would, that's built upon that. So when you ask me if I could be wrong about everything that I claim to know, that can only refer to the knowledge claims, not to the axioms themselves, which are necessary truths. So the answer to your question is yes, because the knowledge aspect of it has to do with uh, receiving sensory input, uh, which is essentially uh, evidence, and then applying it to the axioms themselves and through reason building up the knowledge. So the, strictly speaking, to the knowledge claims, yes, but to the axioms. So you, I mean, personally, I mean, just so it's clear, Personally, you can be wrong about everything you think you know. If we're leaving it strictly to the knowledge aspect, yes. yep, that's correct. Thank you. I'm done with my questions. Okay. All right. You have 10 minutes to cross examine. Okay. All right. Actually, I'm going to have the questions up on the screen here so people they can follow along. question is, do you agree that no reason is possible apart from the God of the Bible? Yes. Second question is, do you accept the God of the Bible of your own free will? No. No. Okay. Well, let's see. an excerpt from, uh, from your website where it says, there are characteristics of God that are beyond our ability to comprehend. For instance, God is one divine being and three distinct persons. Uh, first of all, do you agree with that statement? I wrote it. <laughs> I guess that means you agree with it. I agree with it. Okay. All right. Second, can God reveal things to us, us such that we can know them for certain? Yes. Okay. He has. So do you know for certain that God is one divine being and three distinct, per distinct persons without comprehension? Yes. Would you agree with the definition of faith? It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's in the Bible. I can't disagree with that. Okay. So do you, quote, hope for the Trinity to be true even though you can't comprehend? Well, the thing is, I think that would be a, uh, a, that would be an, a bad interpretation of that verse. But the thing is, I would say I know for certain that the Trinity is true. In a uh, fundamentally flawed podcast with Alex Boat and Jim Gardner on October 15, 2011, uh, it was Jim or Alex, I don't know who asked the question of your then partner on the podcast, Dustin Sears. He asked a question, so do you believe we're predestined to believe whatever we're going to believe and we have no say in it? And Dustin's answer was, I believe that's the case for the one's a Christian theist or one's an atheist. Right. You agree with that? No. No, you don't agree with that. No, I, I think that uh, something along that line, it would take a long time to explain what we actually mean there, but I believe that God plans our free choices. I believe that that's part of his nature. But the thing is, I believe that we have a say in it according to God's plan, which is something that I'd be happy to discuss at a Bible study, but you know I can under I, I disagree with how it's worded there. Actually, when I heard that, I thought, you know, I'm not exactly sure that I'm on board with that. Because I think we do have a say in the matter according to God's plan. We are 100% without excuse for our rejection of it, for our willful rejection of it. Well, you said willful rejection. That's right. But you don't accept God of your own free will. That's right. I don't believe in free will. I believe in free choice. There's a difference. 
because in a sense, I, I don't have the nature of a bird, so I don't have the free will to fly, because it's a contrary to my nature. I cannot do that. I'm not free to do that which is contrary to my nature. I'm only to do, free to do that which is according to my nature. So, for instance, those who are dead in their transgressions and sins are not free to choose Christ. He must bring them to life so that they can choose Him. So I don't have the will to do that which is out of my nature. I am able to choose that which is within my nature. So is that how you would answer the question? So you believe we're predestined to believe whatever we're going to believe? In yeah, we are, we are predestined, but I wouldn't go, I wouldn't say we're not, we have no say in the matter. I don't think, I'm a compatibilist. <coughs> I, I'm not a determinist, I'm a compatibilist. So we have say, but we don't have free will. We have free choice, but we don't have free will. That's right. Free, free, free. Well, I just explained that again. I'm not free to choose that which is contrary to my nature. But that, like I say, that's a deep theological discussion. That's not to do with the existence of God, but I'd be happy to discuss that further if you like. Okay. Do you agree with the statement that the first sin in the Garden of Eden was autonomy, the ability to choose and think for itself? Yes. So, is it a sin for you to choose to be a Christian? No. Will you choose to be a Christian? Not autonomously. There's another way to choose? Yes. According to your nature? No, according to God enabling me. God, I don't make a choice on my own, I make the choice with God. It's not autonomously. Do you believe the statement well, Christians believe things that don't make sense. Um, I would say that we believe things which don't make sense to an unbeliever who denies. Like for instance, my Bible says that a snake talk, that a dog can talk. That does not make sense to an unbeliever. So I'd say if, if I believe things that don't make sense to people, like I don't believe that out of uh, having witnessed it. I believe that out of the testimony of God's word. I don't say it doesn't make sense. I say it doesn't make sense to those who deny God. On the surface, it would appear that they don't. Is it possible to verify the biblical claim that God is omniscient? Um, I would say that uh, it doesn't require verification. I would say you cannot verify something above your, high, your ultimate authority. If your ultimate, I'll give you an example. If your ultimate authority is God. You can't say to me, prove God with something other than God, because then God wouldn't be your highest authority. Just like if I were to ask you to prove the validity of your reasoning, you couldn't go outside of your reasoning to prove that your reasoning is out, because then it wouldn't be your highest authority. So I would say that it doesn't require verification. It's my highest authority. I'm saying if you don't start there, your worldview is reduced to absurdity. Okay, but the question was, is it possible to verify? I would, well, it depends on what you <coughs> accept for verification. Because I would say, yes, I can verify it right here. With the Bible itself. Right. Is what you're saying. It's because it's my highest authority. You cannot go higher than your highest authority. All ultimate authority claims are self-authenticating. Just like if I asked you for the verification of your reasoning, you would have to give me a reason. So it's it's the same for both worldviews, except that the atheist worldview has a vicious circle where they appeal to their reasoning to justify their reasoning, whereas I appeal to God who validates that form. Is it, I guess the same question, is it possible to verify the biblical claim that God is omnipotent? Again, sure, according to scripture. But there's, there's no external verification. It's impossible. Okay, let me give you an example. If I say that God is the necessary precondition to, to make sense of evidence, and you say, give me evidence for that outside of God. If I give you evidence for that outside of God, it would, de it would deny that claim. So when I say God is the necessary precondition for evidence, of course you cannot go outside of that to give evidence of that, because then you deny the claim. No, you cannot give evidence outside of God to prove that he's a necessary precondition for evidence. And you know this for certain. I do. And your definition of knowledge is justified through belief. Correct. So you're claiming justification for something that you don't have justification. No. I'm claiming that my justification is God. But that's the question. Well, that's, I don't deny circularity. But it's a virtuous circle. Because if you step out of that, you're saying, I reason that my reasoning is valid. I'm saying that God exists because he's told us. He's told each and every one of us. That's why we're without excuse for our sin against him. If God is all powerful, can he change his nature? No. Then how can he be all powerful? Because changing one's nature is not part of being all powerful. Because the, the, the fallacy would be to say, if God is all powerful, he has to be able to change his nature so that he's not all powerful. Which is fallacious. I mean, if you want to go into it, the, the question is, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? That he can't lift it? 
That's the same type of logical fallacy. And I say, if you want a God who can be able to do the logically inconsistent, I say, yes, God can make a rock so big that he can't lift it. And then what are you going to say? Well, then God can't lift that rock and it's not omnipotent, it's not powerful. And I say, no, a God who can do the logically fallacious can lift a rock that he can't lift. See, so to, to posit that God can do the illogical is nonsense. God cannot do the illogical. Doing the illogical is not a characteristic of omnipotence. Because God is holding the logical. In a way, yes, because logic is part of his character. He's not beholden to something outside of him. God is logical, and he cannot be not God. So which came first, God or logic? Neither. God has always existed, and God is logical. So how do you separate God from a metaphor and reality? Uh, you'd have to explain your question. I don't know what you mean. Well, how do I explain it? Because God has revealed his nature. And God has he's revealed his nature. It's not a metaphor for reality. I'll give you a definition of God, if you like. Because I know that that was in question. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And it's being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, which takes is it possible for an all-powerful God to intentionally deceive you? No. No. How is that not possible? Because God cannot lie. Lying is not a constituent of omnipotence. See? So he's, God is incapable of lying. That's correct. Yet he's all-powerful. That's right. right. As you notice, I only asked one question of Dan this afternoon. I had 38 questions written down. Why did I ask Dan only one question? I asked him if he could be wrong about everything he claimed to know. If you can be wrong about everything you claim to know, you can't know anything. And I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody asked me what the speed of the road was out there. And I said, I know it to be 30 miles per hour, but I could be wrong. Does that person know it? No, he does not. So when you say that you can be wrong about everything you claim to know, you don't know anything. And this debate is over. Because Dan's going to come up here and he's going to have rebuttals to all of my questions. He's going to say, well, Sai said that, therefore this. And he's going to make a knowledge claim. And that's right. I will say, how do you know that? How do you know that when you say you could be wrong about everything you claim to know? Because you could be wrong. And if you could be wrong, you don't know. So Dan can ask all the questions he wants. He might, be able, able, he might even be able to trip me up. He might even be able to make me look like a fool. But keep in mind here, unless you start with God, you can't know anything. And the thing is, since, God, since Dan could be wrong about everything he claims to know, he could be wrong about his denial of God. And since he could be wrong about that denial, he can't say God doesn't exist. He can't say that God can't reveal. He can't say that I can't know anything for certain, because he could be wrong. So of the two of us, I've given a justification. Now this debate technically is over. I don't mind continuing to answer questions and you know to answer questions from the audience. But Dan has said that he could be wrong about everything he claims to know. Therefore, he can't know anything. Just to, to uh, just to clarify a few things that he that he said. I don't know if you think I've written down. He said that my worldview that God is an axiom. That's not my worldview. God is not an axiom. God is a necessary presupposition. There is a difference. Axioms cannot be proven. But necessary presuppositions can. And they're proven by the, I don't use a big word, transcendentally. The necessary precondition. God is a necessary precondition for knowledge. As you can see here tonight, that he has said he can be wrong about everything he claims to know. Therefore, he can't know anything. But the thing is, all of us know things. We're going to get out there, we're going to drive on the right side of the road because we know that's the side not to get killed on. We're going to drink water because we know that's not going to kill us. Every one of our thoughts, everything in our head, we can only do that because we know God exists. That's when people stand before him, why they're without excuse. Because they've been poaching on crown land. You know, Dan could say, well, I can know things and I don't believe in God. I can go to this property and I can shoot deer all day long. I can kill them, I can clean them, I can eat them. No problem. I can do that and I don't believe in God. But you know what? There's an owner for that property. 
and there's going to be an accounting. When you go through life saying that I don't need God to know things, and you can see that's not the case. Because without God, Dan can't know anything. Could he be wrong? He could be wrong about everything he claims to know. And if he could be wrong about everything he claimed to know, you don't know anything. Now let's see tonight, this afternoon, if Dan keeps making knowledge of things. And I guarantee you that he will. Thanks a lot. Okay. I want to make uh, yeah, I'll get to it. I, I want to make a distinction. Uh, what Sai is talking about is the difference between knowledge and certain knowledge. When he says certainty, what he's talking about is knowledge without the possibility of error. And in fact, that's what he claims to know attributes of God uh, with certain knowledge. The problem with that argument, it's very simple, it begs the question, this is what I mean. In order to have knowledge without the possibility of error or perfect knowledge, you need justification because knowledge is a justified true belief. But in order to have perfect justification, you need perfect knowledge. It begs the question, it's fallacious, it refutes itself. So the idea of certainty, as far as knowledge without the possibility of error, uh, is a contradiction, because what you end up with is making a justification claim that's not justified. So certain knowledge uh, is not possible. And he's also gone on to say that I can't know uh, anything. Well, he was implying I couldn't know it for certain. But this is why I have my little model up here. We have our axioms, our necessary truths, those minimum bedrock assumptions that we have to start with. I exist, for example. On top of that, we have our house that we built that I've labeled knowledge. Now, I made the distinction when he asked the question to say that I can only be wrong about these because these are subject to evidence that we bring in through our senses. Now, we can have a high degree of confidence, for example, that if I throw my pen up in the air, the gravity is going to pull it back down. I can do that over and over again, and I can have a high degree of confidence in my knowledge claim that my pen will come back down. But I cannot have certain knowledge. I cannot have absolute knowledge. I can't have the type of knowledge that he's claiming for God because you would have to know everything, and like I said, it's begging the question. Now, <coughs> what Sai is also doing is He's essentially saying that atheists are borrowing the Christian worldview when we make any knowledge claims at all. The fact is, these axioms that I'm pointing to are all used, are, are used by all faiths, by all people intuitively. To say that I'm borrowing the Christian worldview is like saying I'm, we're borrowing the air from each other to breathe. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, also, he, you know, he didn't get into this, but I have a few minutes. I want to talk about one thing that's commonly brought up in this type of debate. And that is justification for morality, because I think as a secularist, I have a very strong foundation for morality, so I just want to make this point. First, let me define morality. It's of or relating to principles of right and wrong behavior. Now, right and wrong implies a goal, and using the common understanding of the term, a moral act is defined as that which increases well-being. Now, increased well-being, in turn, enhances cooperation and survival. And the desire to survive is inherent in our nature. And we are, in turn, part of the larger nature. So we're moral because we are, quite literally, creations of nature. Or to use the Christian language, we're moral because we're made in the image of God. Again, God is just a metaphor, a symbolic representation for nature. And no appeal to anything outside of nature is necessary. But we should also note the ma major problem with the Christian conception of morality. The problem is there is no connection between the concept of increased well-being in the Christian worldview. In the Christian worldview, an act is moral if it's commanded by God, regardless of its impact on humanity. Divorcing the actions from the consequences undermines our very notion of morality. 
Now the atheist, however, by recognizing that the ultimate arbiter of morality is well-being, has an objective standard by which to measure all actions. The atheist, for example, has a moral obligation to protect the environment because it increases well-being and ensures a long-term, or excuse me, ensures our long-term sustainable survival. Finally, let me go over and bring up my slide. Presuppositionalism, in a sense, is a gift from God to atheists in order to refute the supernatural claims of Christianity. What he's doing is the presuppositionalist abandons evidence and even abandons justifications in an attempt to create the illusion of invincibility. But when this deception is exposed, the difference between axioms and knowledge, for example, the Christian presuppositionalist is left alone and exposed. I just want to address one point before I get into my uh, closing. We both agreed that knowledge would justify truth, true belief, and Dan was saying that he can have knowledge, but with error. What can you know to be true that you can be wrong about? That can be error. So this is a question, since I'm done asking Dan questions, even if somebody want to write it down, somebody can ask Dan, what do you know to be true, which may be an error? Because I don't get that. All right, my conclusion. I'd like to thank all of you for coming again today, and I'd like to thank Dan once again for engaging me. You know, I didn't come here tonight to change Dan's mind. I didn't come here to change any of your minds either. I know that I can't do that. That's completely out of my hands. What I came here to do is to speak the truth to you, and hopefully to do that in love as I'm commanded. See, today you've heard a lot of truth. To those who reject it, I wish you had your fingers in your ears. Because the truth that you heard, if you reject it, is going to only serve to heap judgment upon you. Now, I understand that there's a lot out there to turn people off of Christianity. I turn on the TV, and I see Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen too, and they make me want to puke. <laughs> but friend, friends, it's illogical to discard a philosophy because of its abuse. I'd probably run out of 90% of the churches out there, if not more. But just because some people do it wrong doesn't mean it is wrong. I have no doubt that if people follow me around, they can find plenty of reasons not to become a Christian. But folks, rejecting Christianity because people do it wrong would be like rejecting atheism because of the likes of Stalin and Pol Pot. What I hope to con convey today, though, are foundational issues. Those issues that lie at the foundation of our ability to call anything right or wrong. That without God, the God of the Bible, we have no foundation for calling anything right or wrong or for even making sense of one thought. My friends, that's the God that I believe in. That's the God that's worthy of our worship, worthy of our thankfulness, worthy of our de devotion, worthy of our praise. But for our own selfish motives, we want to worship, we don't want to worship God, we want to worship ourselves. We want to please ourselves and not God. We want to take his place. We want to tell him what's right and what's wrong. And as Dan has pointed out, that was, after all, the first temptation in the Garden of Eden. God said, do not eat of this fruit. Satan said, if you eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. Eve weighed what God said against what Satan said and made herself the judge. And folks, that's exactly what we're doing today. We want to run our lives on our own and think we know better than God what's good for us. God, I don't need you to know anything. God, I know better what's right and what's wrong. God, I want to do it my way. My friends, that's the path which leads to destruction. God is God and we're not. But folks, no amount of truth that I give you today is going to make you change your hearts. That takes repentance turning from the rejection of the God that you know exists and turning from your sin against him. 
You see, God doesn't send people to hell for denying what they don't know. God sends people to hell for their sin against the God that they do know. Look, I believe in a book that says that a donkey talked. That a man walked on water, that a man who was dead for three days came back to life. No doubt, you can think of many reasons to reject that. I've never seen it happen. I don't believe that based on personal experience. I believe that based on the testimony of God and His Word. Of course, if you reject that, if you reject God, you're going to think that's crazy. But folks, unless you start with God, you can't make sense of anything. You can't make sense of your objection against Him. You can't make sense of even one of your thoughts. You can't make sense of anything you claim to know. But you're going to continue to make knowledge claims and truth claims. And you can continue to trust your reasoning, but you can't make sense of any of that without God. And folks, it's a wicked thing to deny your Creator. And all of us, myself included, do that to some degree all the time. Every time I sin, I reject the God who made me. I deserve hell just as much as each and every one of you, maybe even more. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, death and eternity in hell. Not because God is some kind of cosmic meaning, but because that's what our sin deserves. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're dead in our transgressions and sin, but God in his love sent his son to bring us back to life. I urge you not to turn your back on him. I urge you to beg for repentance. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. People often focus on the way and the truth, but my friends, there is no life without Christ, just a patchwork of misery. Jesus Christ did not only die to save souls in the hereafter, but he died to save us in the here and now. I don't know if there's any sheep among the atheists out here today, but I know that Jesus Christ said, my sheep, hear my voice. If there are any out there, I urge you to beg for repentance that you too might come to know the salvation and the peace which passes all understanding. Yeah, well, he does that. <coughs> I knew that. It's going to do his good. If you got any more questions, make sure you get off here to the front uh, in the next couple of minutes. Okay. Well, I am disappointed that I only got the one question from Cy. Uh, I think you're going to have to ask yourself, why didn't he ask me more questions? I think the answer is uh, pretty obvious that I, I'm on to the presuppositional trick and the more questions he asks the more it would show that I do in fact understand the difference between knowledge and the axioms of the presuppositions and if the more questions he would ask the more that it would expose that so I think it's pretty obvious but the question before us here today is does God exist and if by God we mean the personal revelatory God of the Bible the answer is clearly no the concept of omniscience alone, as I've explained, is enough to doom the entire enterprise. But you don't have to take my word for it, and you don't need to be a student of logic to see that the Christian God cannot possibly exist. Mr. Bruggenkate himself has told us that this is the case. On his website, Sai has several videos in which he is teaching other Christians his presuppositional method. Method. Sai explains that he used to use evidence to try and prove God. What? Uh, why don't I use these arguments, he asks, because they're bad arguments, he answers. And one argument, he says, was his favorite, the cosmological argument. I used to love that argument, he said. That used to be my favorite argument. It's garbage. So, if your attempts to prove God exists are, quote, garbage, what do you do? Give it up? Well, maybe. Or you can presuppose it's true. You can stomp your feet and insist it just has to be true. I heard Sai tell a story on one of his videos about a man that thought he was dead. The story meant, was meant to convey the idea that the non-believer couldn't be convinced to accept the reality of God based upon evidence. The story goes something like this. 
there was a man that was convinced that he was dead. His friends and his family tried to convince him he wasn't dead, but he insisted. Finally, in desperation, they took him to a doctor to try and change his mind. The doctor asked the, the man if dead men bleed. The man thought for a moment and said, no, dead men don't bleed. So the doctor immediately stuck him in the finger with a needle and blood began to come out. The man looked at the blood and then looked at the doctor and exclaimed, well, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. So ask yourself, who's the dead man here today? <laughs> but this is more than a funny story about being closed-minded because what we believe informs how we act. Whether we are, as many Christians profess, degraded beings unworthy of God's grace, or whether we are intelligent, independent humans deserving of respect. What was the first sin in the Garden of Eden, I asked his audience, and then answering for them, the first sin in the Garden of Eden was autonomy, the ability to choose and think for oneself. Think about that for a minute. Well, or maybe not. Apparently that would be a sin. You have in your possession the most powerful tool in the history of the universe. Let me say that again. You have in your possession the most powerful tool in the history of the universe. Can it really be a sin to use it? Now, speaking about non-believers, I said the goal of apologetics is to lovingly close their mouths in the hope that the Holy Spirit works in their hearts when they have nothing more to say. Really? His message is sit down and shut up? Now, contrast this to the rationalist, humanist, atheist view. I believe in you. I trust you and respect you. I trust your ability to consider our arguments, to weigh our evidence, and to decide for yourselves what to believe. I came across a humanist version of the Ten Commandments some time ago, and number one on the list, proclaim the natural dignity and inherent worth of all human beings. And it was the great Enlightenment era philosopher Immanuel Kant that recognized that human dignity is derived from autonomy, from the ability to direct your own destiny. He wrote, quote, always recognize that human individuals are ends and do not use them as means to your end. In other words, we are not, as Psy would have us, silent robots commanded by an incomprehensible master. We are autonomous beings. But without the ability to choose and think for oneself, quote, we have no autonomy and we have no dignity. Fortunately, the choice really is yours. I hope you choose dignity. Now, I have just a few seconds left. Uh, and I just want to thank you, the audience, for listening carefully. No matter which side you're on, you have listened and considered opposing views, and I appreciate that, and that gives me hope that we can continue this type of dialogue in the future. You all may also be thinking that I've been anything other than a gracious host to our Canadian visitor by calling him deceptive or by employing a bit of sarcasm. Let me be clear that I'm not accusing Sai of being intentionally deceptive, but I believe the deception is inherent in the argument itself. I also don't believe Sai is deluded or a bad person. <coughs> we are all, in a sense, made in the image of God. So I'm willing to trust that Sai wants the world to be a better place, just the same as I do, even if we're taking different paths to get there. Thank you. All right, we're going to do some questions here. Each, uh, each one will have a chance to answer two minutes each. Got a lot of questions here. We'll see how far we can get. And um, I'm not going to waste any time by talking, so let's get to it. This question is for Sai. And it says, you say that we can't make sense of anything without God, that we know from everyday experience that atheists can make sense of existence. We know from experience. We know when our experience shows that what we believe works. For example, we know gravity is true because we have observed it over and over, no faith needed. Question is, what about experience and observation? 
And that's a very good point, and it's a very clear misunderstanding of what I'm saying. I'm not saying you have to acknowledge God in order to make sense of things. I'm saying that God is necessary to make sense of things. Because you could just as easily say, I can speak. I have no problem speaking, and I don't believe in words. I don't believe in words, but I can still speak. I'm not saying that you have to acknowledge that words exist in order to speak. I'm not saying that you have acknowledged that God exists in order to know things. That God must exist in order to know things. Because otherwise, you end up saying, I could be wrong. And if you could be wrong, you don't know. Would <coughs> you like to respond to that at all? Uh, could you reread the question for me? Sure. Uh, basically, the question comes down to, as atheists, we can make sense of existence. We know from experience. We know when our experience shows that what we believe works. For example, we know gravity is true because we've observed it over and over and no faith is needed. So the question is, what about experience and observation? Right. What he's doing is making somewhat of a distinction between the axiom and the knowledge claim itself, and that's what's important. We talk about evidence, then we're talking about knowledge because we receive evidence via our senses. In fact, we have to uh, use our senses. It's the only way that we can get information. So our senses being provisionally valid uh, is a necessary truth. That's an axiom in itself, as it were. Um, so we, we take in that information through our senses as evidence and then build it upon the axioms of the piece. So uh, that's what we're talking about in experiencing the world. We have to experience it through our senses. So they're just acknowledging that. Um, Let's see. Next question. The theory of evolution explains why we have racial differences through genetics, migration, and local adaptation. Please explain how two homogenous people can be the progenitors of the human race. I assume this is written inside, so you genesis. I mean, this isn't a debate about evolution. How God created the race, I have no idea. That's, that's irrelevant. I don't, I don't care. I don't know how God did it. You know, people want to get that fine. But you know, I mean, even people uh, who are evolutionists talk about some kind of biological Eve. So, I mean, they also believe that. They just believe that there's billions of years involved in that. But I don't know how God made the races. Anything you want to add to that? I mean, the question stands on its own. It's the fact is you can't get to where we're at from two individuals 6,000 years ago. And this question is addressed to you, so I'm going to do that. If man is the measure of all things, then how can man condemn one society or action and not another? On what basis, if there is no object, on what basis could you do that? If there is no objective morality based on God's existence. Well, my answer is there is an objective, and that's what I was getting to with the well-being. Uh, our intuitive understanding of morality is that it has to do with well-being or our well-being that is the objective measure now whether an action increases or decreases well-being is in fact an objective measure so it's a measure outside of ourselves that we can objectively look at so we can look at our actions and say you know is pushing an old woman down the stairs does that increase or decrease well-being and we can use our reason and our intuition to determine whether or not that's the case. So we are not ourselves the standard. It's not a subjective measure. It's an objective measure as in the truth or falsity, falsity of the claim or the action regarding to well-being. Now, I want you to keep in mind with all the answers that Dan gives to making knowledge claims. He's already said he'd be wrong about everything he thinks to know. But to sneak in a standard of well-being without God I mean, I could just say, I don't care about well-being. I like pushing women downstairs. I enjoy that. It makes me happy. It increases the well-being of my life. I enjoy it. And without God, without an absolute standard, you can't tell me I'm wrong. What if there's a nation of people that, that voted to say that pushing old ladies downstairs actually is good for our society because there's a, an, uh, an old mouth that you, know, you don't have to feed it? I mean, people can make all sorts of excuses, but without an absolute standard, He's just stipulating that well-being is the standard. Why can't I stipulate that my happiness is, is the standard? With, if morality can be stipulated, anybody is free to stipulate their own. And that's the problem. I know people talk about Hitler and stuff. He stipulated his morality. And the thing is, 
We went over there and stopped what Hitler did. So we think our morality is better than his morality. But without, without an absolute standard, you don't get better. You get different. But nobody thinks our, our morality was just different. We think it was better because we have an absolute standard. We can't have that without God. Next question, and um, this is addressed to Sai. Why must God? Why must a God exist? Why must a God exist? God exists because you cannot make sense of anything without presupposing Him. Um, it's the simple fact is that God does exist. Why must He exist? Nothing is possible without Him. We can make up all sorts of you know convoluted ideas. And, you know, Dan says that I only ask one question because uh, I, he knows the secret. I've got 38 questions. I can ask them all. I can say to him, where do you get truth from evolution? Because if evolution is true, our, just, our thoughts are the byproduct of chemical reactions. It would be like taking a bottle of Coke in the bottle of Mountain Dew and shaking them and watching them fizz and saying one fizz is true and one fizz is false. He's fizzing atheistically. I'm fizzing theistically. That's what evolution gives you. Evolution does not give you truth. I can ask all sorts of questions, but once you say you'd be wrong about everything you claim to know, knowledge doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's just why must the God exist? If you don't mind, I'm actually going to respond to Sai's comment instead of the, the, the question directly. I think it's pretty obvious that God does not have to exist, especially the Christian God. Um, and this is something I heard, heard him make a claim the random unguided fist thing uh, somehow cannot account for truth. Actually, I've heard Sai in a couple of debates, uh, one with uh, occasional partner Dustin Seegers down in North Carolina. What in making his argument that uh, is, what he's doing is called the fallacy of irrelevant thesis. Now, how we got here, or even what makes a claim, is completely irrelevant to the truthfulness of a claim itself. You know, like, for example, if I say the sky is blue, or I knock the box of toothpicks on the floor and it spells it out, the claim is still true regardless of who or what is making the claim. So when Sai says random unguided chemical reactions can't account for truth, for example, he's actually just speaking nonsense. Now, what he could do is he could change the term truth to thought, in which case it would make grammatical sense, but now he's making a different error called the fallacy of ignorance, or the argument of ignorance which is a fallacy. And that's not to say that Sai is ignorant, but it means that because Sai doesn't understand the natural process of how we got here, he wants a supernatural answer to the default winner. So that argument, uh, is completely fallacious at this point. <coughs> this question would be for you, Dan. Um, I'm assuming that this question is based on the idea that you said that God is a metaphor. So how does a metaphor produce predictive prophecy? Well, I, my question is, give me a predictive prophecy that actually, that actually came true. And even if, well, there's lots of different prophecies in the Bible, and there's, in my opinion, there's only one, and that's what Jesus predicted, that he would come back within the lifetime of his prophets, and that spe failed spe spectacularly. Um, but the problem is, even if the prophecies were 100% accurate, that doesn't get you any closer to perfect knowledge. Perfect knowledge, as I explained before, is self-refuting. It begs the question, and it refutes itself. It's a contradiction. So all you could say, even, even if, and I don't grant that any of them are valid, but even if all the prophecies of the Bible were true, were true, all you could say is somebody had a lot of knowledge to be able to make that prediction. That's all it gets you, and they're clearly not true. What I'd like you to do is think to yourself, after Dan says anything, think, how does he know that? Could he be wrong? And according to Dan's earlier, you'd have to say that he could be wrong. But you notice something that he says, perfect knowledge is self-refuting. Does he know that perfectly? Does he know that perfect knowledge is self-refuting? Does he know that perfectly? If he doesn't, he could be wrong about that. And then it's not self-refuting. That's the nonsense that atheism leads to. Atheism leads to. Now he's talking to me about logical fallacies. I've asked him lots of questions about logic. Do you know what logic is? Logic is universal, absolute, immaterial laws. You can't get that with atheism. Atheists believe in a world that's only made of matter and is constantly changing. Where do you get universal, abstract, 
invariant laws in a world without God. God is universal. God is not made of matter. God does not change. Logic makes sense in my world. So I can claim a logical fallacy. But he's going to say, that's logically fallacious. You know, somebody write down this question. Well, where do you get an absolute, unchanging, immaterial law in a universe that's constantly changing, only made of matter? It doesn't make sense. When he brings up a logical fallacy, he's assuming God. And that's what I'm saying. You can't make sense of anything unless you start with God. Question here is going to be for Sai. And then obviously both can answer. Why would one be obligated to enslave themselves to a God if one exists? You're not. If you want to go to hell, you're free. Go ahead. The gates of hell are locked on the inside. People that go there choose to go there. You don't have to enslave yourself to God, but I tell you, there is no life out of you. You're just misery. You can cover it up. You, know, you can make it look pretty. But I know what people's lives are like about God. And I'm not saying that I'm the happiest person around, but the Apostle, the Apostle Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord God always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, when he, you know where he was when he said that? He was in prison. I don't think he was very happy, but he was filled with joy because he knew he was going to heaven and he knew he didn't deserve it. Just like me. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. People make the mistake of thinking that Christians try to do good to get to heaven. No. I could never do enough good to get to heaven. I don't do good to get to heaven. I do good because of what Christ did for me because I'm going. That's the difference. Should I comment on that? Yeah. My answer directly to the question is obviously nobody deserves to be enslaved in any sense of the word. And I also don't think that Sai or anybody else for that matter deserves hell. Now, on the idea of heaven, I think heaven can also be considered a metaphor, if you would. Let me explain. What we desire, inherent in our nature, is survival. And one of the reasons we want to survive is so that we can continue to grow in knowledge. The more knowledge that we gain, the more we get closer to what I would call perfect knowledge. You can never get there, but the closer we get to perfect knowledge. Now, Jesus, or God, is often referred to as the truth, or perfect knowledge. So to use Christian terminology, what I strive for is to be in the presence of God. And what does that mean? God is a metaphor for reality, or perfect knowledge. So it makes sense without God being anything other than, as I explained before, a metaphor, a symbolic representation of reality. And you never have to go outside of that. Okay, Some questions to say. I'm an atheist, and according to you, I'm bound for hell. Yet according to you, it is my sin that sends me there, and not my beliefs. If you are a sinner, and I am a sinner, and you are saved, and I am damned, then what is the difference between us other than what we believe? The difference is that Christ paid for my sins. That's the difference. I'm not going because I'm worthy to go to heaven. I'm going because Christ paid for my sins. Because I am a wicked, vile sinner. But Jesus Christ lived the perfect life and he died on the cross for my sins. So that when God looks down upon me, he doesn't see me. He sees Christ upon the cross. And when he sees my sin, he sees them nailed to that cross. That's what I deserve. I get the benefit of Christ's perfect life. That's why I try to live a good life. That's why I come to these debates and talk to you people out there. Not because I'm worthy of anything, but so I can tell you about the gift of salvation. So you can get out of this the misery of your own sinfulness. But people love their sin. That's why they sin. I mean, nobody is tempted to jump in front of a bus because that's not fun. We sin because it's fun. We want to be our own God. But I say, you know, there is no life without Him. And those, I mean, people who reject God, they do that well. Well, I, I agree with the question that there is no difference other than what they believe. But let me just address the idea of uh, Jesus uh, paying for our sins. I gave a, a presentation to our group, I mean, it was about a year ago. And the title of the presentation was Christianity is Un American. And most people would say, what, what do you mean Christianity is America? Well, this whole idea of vicarious uh, atonement is completely un-American because what, what Sai is saying is that Jesus suffered and died for his sins. Where's the personal responsibility in that? Isn't that what America's all about? Individual responsibility? I'm responsible for my acts. 
Would it be right for my brother to be punished for something that I did? No, we inherently recognize that that's immoral, that's not correct, it's un-American, if you will. So this idea that somebody else can, be, can suffer and die for our sins, again, it's inherently immoral and it's un-American. Questions. A lot of questions here for Sai. But, uh, <laughs> Sai, how do you explain stars coming into existence every day? How do I explain them coming into existence every day? I'm a, not an astrophysicist, but uh, I don't even know if that's the fact that stars come into existence every day. I think that's one thing that the atheists would have difficulty with. I know they call it some kind of arch cloud that makes these stars. You know, people, everybody has a rescuing device. If there's something that I can, I can explain, I say, well, God did it. But the thing is, that's an adequate explanation. How is the atheist explain stars coming to existence? They're going to, you know, pause some kind of work. I don't know. It, it doesn't concern me. I'm just saying you can't even reason about stars unless you start with God. You can't make sense of even one thought. Because, you know, I, and I don't know, probably don't have a lot of time here, but one thing that we assume is uniformity of nature. We assume that the word, the thoughts in our head and the words coming out of our mouth mean the same thing they did five seconds ago. Without God, you have no basis for that. You have no basis for even thinking making sense of one thought in your head, because you have to believe in the uniformity of nature, which doesn't make sense without God. All you can say is, well, it's always been like that, so it's always going to be like that, and that's a logical fallacy of begging the question. Well, I'm, not, I'm also not a physicist, but I am an engineer, so I think I may have a, a decent grasp of how stars are formed. And so I'm talking about Oort clouds, essentially. It's dust and particles being drawn together by gravity until you get a critical mass and enough temperature in the internal mass of the star to ignite the fusion process. It's, it's pretty straightforward how stars uh, began. But you know, the interesting thing is going to put some meaning to this. Uh, and there's some cards on the table about a gentleman by the name of Michael Dow who's coming to speak in Syracuse on July 10th. And he makes the point that, in fact, all of the chemicals that make up our body, we know this for a fact. Physicists have you know, been able to model this. We know that the chemicals that make up our body were actually fused inside dying stars. Supernova, when they're created, release so much energy, they actually fuel, fuse these atoms together so that they create the more complex elements that make up the Earth, our bodies, and so forth. So, you know, it's interesting, in a sense, we are born from the death of a son. Or to use Christian language, you know, Jesus, the Son of God, died for us. So it, it, it almost makes sense, <coughs> again, without God being anything other than a metaphor for reality. Uh, and the other thing that Michael Dowd says, I think that's very profound, is that we are the universe becoming conscious of itself. Now think about that for a minute. We, we are of the universe, and we're able to contemplate the universe itself. Now, for me, that gives me tremendous meaning to be able to understand that. And, and to be part of something so grand is, uh, it's, it's amazing and it's all inspiring. That's cool. All right, uh, Sai, what makes the Bible have the right to judge how humanity lives its life? Because it's God's word. God created us. That's why. Very simple. God made us. You know, if you're a potter and you make two pots, and you take one of those pots and you throw it on the ground and smash it into smithereens. Can anybody else say, you don't have the right to do that? You can't do that. No. He made it. God is all good. So we know that what he does is good. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem with using the Bible uh, as your moral guide. The problem is you're stuck with a two to three thousand year old document and the best wisdom that they had in time. Now, I'm not saying that the Bible authors didn't have some good things to say. The Golden Rule, for example. But the problem is that, that Christianity and religion in general doesn't have any type of self-correction mechanism. It's like saying we haven't learned anything in the last two thousand years. What, what mechanism does Christianity have to say we've learned about DNA or about cosmology, how do, we, how do we apply that 
and update our understanding so we, that we know whether our actions are increase or, increasing or decreasing well-being. There's no mechanism for that, unless, ironically, you borrow from the secular scientific worldview, which says that we take evidence and we evaluate the evidence and we update what we know. Slavery is a perfect example. The Bible implicitly validates slavery over and over again. We've been able to figure out that owning another person is inherently immoral. It decreases well-being for everybody. So we've been able to correct using our reasoning, our natural ability to reason, to be able to say, you know what? The Bible authors had some things right, but they had some things wrong. And we need to be able to correct those things and to update what we know and to make the world better for everyone. Question here, and then a clarifying comment, I guess. What is the source of God? what is the source of God's nature? And the comment is, if it is God, I'm not sure what this word is, so I'm probably going to massacre it. The euthyphro, euthyphro dilemma. Yeah, euthyphro dilemma applies. Um, well, euthyphro dilemma. I don't know who the question. If they if they, if they want to uh, clarify what they're saying, are they saying is God all good because He's got some kind of standard? Know, by which he measures goodness. But, but that's nothing. Goodness is God's nature. And what the unbeliever has to be able to say is that God does not have a morally sufficient reason for the evil in this world. And they have no basis for that. You're the one that asked the question. I was ask, what's the source of his nature? What's it? Well, it, that's just like saying, what's the source of the nature of wetness? I mean, God is God. What's the source of it? God's God. He doesn't. He didn't derive it from anywhere else. Well, then you throw the level applies. Well, explain that. Because explain the problem with you. You throw you throw the level. I think we should just carry on right now because I right now I'm not. Okay, no, that, that's fine. But the thing is, there is no dilemma. The, the dilemma is that God does not have a morally sufficient reason for the evil in this world. But that's a <coughs> to prove, and they have to get a standard of morality in order to judge God. And that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden, saying, no, God, it's not the way you want it, it's the way that I want it. See, because, you know, one of the things that Dan was saying is about slavery, of course, to equate modern-day slavery with biblical slavery, I mean, that's fallacious in and of itself. But what Dan has to believe is that slave owners evolved. The people who kept slaves also evolved. How come they evolved wrong and we evolved right? You know, the slave owners could say, no, I evolved to say that slave owners, you know, slave ownership was right. And Dan will say, I evolved to say that slave ownership was wrong. Who's right? Majority? So if the majority of people became slave owners, then it would be right? Without God, you can't make sense of calling slave ownership wrong. Okay. Here, well, let me I just jot it down. Uh, it's pretty gross uh, dilemma. It essentially goes something like this. Does God command it because it's good? Or is it good because he commands it? And, and Sai is trying to walk a fine line here, saying it, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply to the Christian God that he believes in. The problem is he's by default taken the second uh, position. He's saying it's good because God commands it, because it's part of his nature. The problem is the very concept of good implies an objective standard. So God cannot be the source. If God commands it, it just is. We're making the judgment whether it's good or not good. So there is an external standard that's being applied. So the, the dilemma still still applies, and we have an external standard to judge whether something is good or not good. It's, it's just that simple. And it's a dilemma that's never been answered, in my understanding, sufficiently by any Christian. Well, if you don't mind, I'll answer that question right now. But because the thing is, stealing is not wrong because God commands us not to steal. I'm gonna say that again. Stealing is not wrong because God commands us not to steal. Stealing is wrong because God is not a thief. And we were created in his image. When we steal, we lie about who God is. That's why it's wrong. Not because God commands, he does command it based on his character. But it's not wrong because he commands it. It's wrong because God is not a thief. Okay, uh, 
next question is, what characteristic of Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim is more likely than any other god? I'm not exactly sure. About All that. of them, because there are no other gods. Psalm 96 verse 5 says, All the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. I know a lot of atheists say, Well, you're atheistic towards those other gods. I just believe in one less god than you. No. Scripture says they're all idols. I'm not atheistic towards them. They're not theists. They're idolaters. And I'm not an idolater. I try not to. I don't necessarily understand the question, but the idea of different characteristics uh, of gods. I, I think I've demonstrated my presentation pretty conclusively that, that there are lots of different characteristics that or attributes, if you would, that are required in order for the conception to be specifically the Christian God. And it's all of those, those attributes that uh, are completely unnecessary when it comes to uh, truth or knowledge claims. Uh, so I think maybe what the question is getting to is, you know, if, I'm, if I started with the, with the, uh, the Hindu God or the Muslim God, or the invisible pink unicorn, or whatever this argument's been made several times, that I could make exactly the same claim as what Sai is making, that this is my basis for knowledge. It's, it, they're transcendent, they know everything, they're all powerful. The problem is that these attributes are unjustifiable, and to claim knowledge of them is an inherent contradiction. And that's really the crux of the problem, is to claim knowledge and justify true belief of something for which there is no, or you're not willing to offer justification, is the crux of the problem. And until that's being, until you're able to demonstrate that, there's absolutely no reason to believe that such a thing exists. Okay, this question's for, for Dan. If the Big Bang were true, how can life possibly exist since the Big Bang produced a great amount of heat which would effectively sanitize the universe. Well, the, the problem with that, Matt, is it assumes that life was existing at the time of the quote unquote event, the Big, the big Bang. Uh, and from all of our, all the evidence we have is that life first emerged here on Earth about three and a half billion years ago, but the Big Bang itself occurred approximately 13.7 billion years ago. So, yeah, it was incredibly hot, incredibly small space in which all of the uh, mass of the universe initially, uh, I wouldn't say initially existed, because it's possible it existed before that. But from that event, uh, it expanded outward and it cooled to the point where we are today. So it's been cooling for 13.7 billion years. Uh, and matter has condensed from that initial condition uh, and been fused in stars and so forth. It's a very, very well understood process. Except that Dan could be wrong about that. He talks about facts. There are no facts. That be wrong. Now, you know, this question didn't really apply to me, so I'll address the, the other question. He says, you know, that could apply to any of the gods of the visible pink unicorn. You know, those would be valid arguments, but they wouldn't be sound arguments. Sound arguments, the premises have to be true. And if he wants to argue for one of those premises being true, then he's no longer an atheist. And that's, I was debating a PhD in philosophy, and folks, I was working in the faculty four years ago. But I was debating a PhD in philosophy, I said, how can you know anything to be true? Same type of question. He would never answer. And I badgered him, because that's what I do. And you know what he finally said? My justification for truth is the invisible pink unicorn. And I said to him, guess what? You are no longer an atheist. And he said, yeah, and you're gonna discard my God as quickly as I discard, discard your God. I said, not at all. You book the hall, I'll fly to England, and I'll debate you. you argue for the invisible pink unicorn being the foundation of knowledge and truth, I'll argue for the God of Scripture. And he said to me, I'll only do that if I can say I'm arguing a parody, something made up. I said, if you're arguing something made up, what's your justification for truth and knowledge? And you know what? You got silence. Because a PhD in philosophy wasn't, doesn't want some hack who worked in the factory four years ago to make him look like a fool. And that's what would happen. That's why they won't debate. That's why someone like that won't debate him, because he's going to claim invisible pink unicorn. And I'm going to show him how, with that justification, This is a question for you, Cy. Um, the Bible documents deception by God in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, 1 Kings 22, 20, verse 23. With this in mind, how does revelation work, and what justification is there for believing it? 
Well, I would say that that's a misinterpretation of Scripture, that God is a secondary means. God doesn't deceive people, that he uses people. And the thing is, God can do that sinlessly. What was the second half of the question, sir? <coughs> what justification is there for believing it? For, for believing God's revelation? Yeah. See, that's another thing that people say. People all over the world have revelations. You know, that woman drowned her kids in the car because she said God told her to. But the thing is, just because there are false revelations doesn't mean there can't be true ones. That's a fallacy of hasty generalization. I was debating an atheist who brought up something very similar. And I said to him, would it make sense to say that there's no real money because there's counterfeit money? Would it make sense to say there's no real revelation because there's fake ones? And do you know what this guy said to me? It's online. It's my third debate with Paul Bear. I said, would it make sense to say there's no real money because there's counterfeit money? And do you know what he said to me? Yes. At that point, the debate's over. My third debate with Paul Bear. Check it out. It's on my multimedia page. I couldn't believe it. I should have just got up and said, thank you for coming up. In Sai's answer, he said there was, that reading was a misinterpretation. I think what he's pointing out is that when he reads the, reads the Bible, it needs to be interpreted. You take in the information through your eyes, through your senses, and you interpret it, that information, and you apply it to your model of reality to see if it sticks, essentially. But he's also claiming that he has certain knowledge that this information is true. In other words, he's saying, I can interpret perfectly without the possibility of error. Now, that would be a neat trick, but I would like to know how Sai can justify that he has perfect knowledge, that his senses are perfect all the time. That's essentially what he's claiming. You have to interpret what you read in the Bible. In order to have certain knowledge, or perfect knowledge, you'd have to be able to interpret perfectly. And I don't know, maybe he's making the claim that he's infallible, I think that's yet to be established. Well, I don't know if you folks want me to address that. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I have perfect knowledge. I'm saying God has perfect knowledge and he can reveal some things to me that such like be certain. I'm not saying I know everything, but I'm saying I can know something for certain. And he can't say for certain that that's not possible because he has no justification for knowledge. And the funny thing is, when you say that our knowledge isn't always right, you know what you're saying? You're making a knowledge claim. You're saying, I know that our knowledge is but are you right about that? Is that perfect knowledge that we're not always right? To deny knowledge is self refuting His question is for Dan. Uh, do you believe that it is immoral for one person to choose to die so that billions of people could live? Do I believe it's immoral for one person to choose to die so that billions of people could live? I wouldn't call it immoral. And the reason I would not call it immoral, and I have an objective standard, is if that was truly the case, then it would be increasing well-being. So my objective standard is that such an act, such an altruistic act, would be moral. Well, the interesting thing about that is Dan says I wouldn't call that moral based on my objective standard. But you know what? Somebody else could say, well, I would call that immoral based on mine. And that's the problem. If you can stipulate morality, anyone is free to stipulate their own. And the thing is, I have an unfair advantage in this debate because I know that each and every one of you know that God exists. And you know what you're going to do? If you want to walk out here not believing in God, you're going to hook onto whatever pearl that you got from Dan, and you're going to ignore everything that I say. But I have that advantage because the hound of heaven will not let you go. If you're one of his sheep, he will draw you in. I have that advantage. You know, I don't have to worry about that. You know, I can say, I can speak words, but it doesn't matter what I speak to you guys today. If God wants you, you're his. This is for Sai. If there is one God, why are there so many religions? Very simple. People don't want that one God. People make up idols. Because the thing is, G.K. Chesterton said, when we cease to worship God, we don't worship nothing. We worship anything. When you cease to worship God, you don't worship nothing. You worship anything. You worship a model, uh, uh, something made of wood. You worship jewelry. You worship alcohol. You worship sex. When you cease to worship God, you don't worship nothing. You worship anything. That's why there's so many religions. Well, the 
answer to why there's so many religions is because they're all different models of reality. In fact, that's how we view the world, is that we don't view reality directly, is we actually create models of reality using our axioms and using our reason. And then what we do is we take in evidence and we see how that fits within our model. And the better the model fits the evidence, the more likely it is to be uh, an accurate model of reality. So what Christianity is doing or what Islam is doing is they're creating models of reality. The problem, the problem with any of these religions that rely upon a book as being perfect information is that they have no way of modifying that information, no way of updating that information as new evidence comes in. So the Bible gives us a model of reality, but in that model itself, there are contradictions to the evidence we've been able to get. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the, I don't know the exact passage, but in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus being taken up onto the mountain by, by the devil so he can survey all of the kingdoms of the world. Now, if you believe that the earth was flat, that makes sense. You can see the entire world from a high place. Now, at the time the Bible was written, okay, people of that era, that time, believed that the earth was flat. But now the Greeks showed us the earth is actually a sphere. How do you now update that information to, to modify your model of reality so it comports better to the reality itself? If you've got a book that's your go-to document, you, you, you're stuck. You're stuck with the wisdom of the time. There's no way to update it. And that's exactly what science gives us, is the ability to update our model based upon new evidence. <coughs> The next question, Sai, is if God is powerful and good, why does he need hell? He doesn't need it. But the thing is, God is all powerful and God is all good, but he's also just. And you need hell as a place where those are, people are justly punished for their sin against God. Hell is necessary for people to go to reject God who don't want it. Now the thing is, you know, talking about hell, for instance, what we're saying, you know, I used to make a mistake too. I said, you know, people are happy, they'll probably get to hell because they're going to be away from God. Well, that's not the case because, you know what? Satan doesn't rule in hell. God does. God doesn't lose his omnipotence just because the world is over. God will be there casting his vengeance upon people for eternity. In the example I give, let's say you get divorced, and through financial reasons, you have to live in the same house with this woman that you hate. And you see that person all the time and you hate it. That is a very small picture of what hell would be like. But if you're in love with your wife and you're on the other side of the world, you will still have that relational love. And the thing that will be missing from those who end up in hell and choose it, what will be missing is the opportunity for a relationship. That will be the separation from God. But he'll still be there casting the vengeance upon people. And hell has to exist. For instance, for Christians can see, to see characters of God like his justice and his mercy. The just judge would not just let people off. Let me ask a rhetorical question in response to that. And the question is, what could I possibly do? What could anybody possibly do to thwart the will of an all-knowing, all-powerful creator? The answer is there's nothing. There's nothing that I could do to thwart his will. So if I committed a sin, for example, against this creator, what effect could it possibly have? How could he be offended? If he wanted something different, if he's truly all-knowing and all-powerful, it would be different. I can't change the course of history if there's an all-powerful, all-knowing creator in charge of history. Yet, that's exactly what we're being told that we're doing. If we exercise free will or free choice or however you want to say it, then what we're doing is thwarting God's will. But how is it that he's all powerful if we're able to thwart his will? It doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense if this omnipotent, omniscient creator is a metaphor for reality. And then we do, in fact, have the ability to control our own destiny. I, I did a, a video online and I talked about the, the characteristic of, uh, of omnipotence, of all-powerful, being all-powerful. 
what that essentially does, that characteristic, is it says that if I'm all powerful and all knowing, by the way, there is absolutely nothing, in, by the way, and there's no time between the desire for something and it being achieved. So the threat of hell is a means to an end, but if you're all powerful, you don't need to use a means to an end, it just happens. So this idea of, of hell is completely nonsensical because God wouldn't need hell if he's all knowing. Besides, after you're dead, what difference would it make to the rest of us whether or not you actually go to hell? Why wouldn't you just go to heaven? It makes absolutely no sense. So the question is, what makes a God the only way to find knowledge? Well, the example that I gave is that if you make a knowledge claim, you say, I know A. <clears throat> How do you know A? Because of B. And it becomes an infinite regress. Because no matter what knowledge Dan, uh, claim Dan makes, I would say, how do you know that? And he's already said he could be wrong about everything he thinks you know. So any knowledge you think he makes, say, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? It's an infinite regress. Unless you know everything, that regress doesn't stop. How do you know? How do I know I'm sitting here while my sense is coming? How do I know my sense are valid while my brain's coming? How do I know my reasoning's valid while I went to the doctor? How do you know the doctor telling you? It goes on and on and on and on. Unless you start with God, you can't make sense of anything. Now, does that not mean that we don't know things for certain using our sense and reasoning? No. But we cannot justify using them without starting with God. Because he has to say, I sense and reason that my sense and reasoning is valid. And that's a vicious circle. I can say, I know that my sense and reasoning are valid because God uses them so that I can know things for certain. I, I've let this comment go a few times and somehow I can't uh, have knowledge at all uh, without knowing things for certain or without having a Christian God. The fact is, it's not an infinite regress. And where it stops is with the necessary truths. And that's why I gave the example of I exist. I exist is a necessary truth because of the impossibility of the contrary. I cannot exist. I mean, excuse me, I, I do not exist is an impossible statement. It's a self-refuting statement. So I exist is necessarily true. I exist is not a knowledge claim. That's the trick that Psy keeps popping up, rapid, he's pulling out of the hat, is he says, how do you know? How do you know? But know is justified true belief. And then I have to make that perfectly clear. When I say I exist, I'm not making a knowledge claim. It's a necessary truth. And that's extremely important to understand. That's where my spade is turned, as Wittgenstein said. That's the most important thing. If you leave here with, without anything else, remember, where you stop in this supposed infinite regress is where your spade is turned, the necessary truths. That's where you start. Then you have a solid foundation in which to build on. Beside all your arguments and knowledge come from the book in front of you. Have you ever read it in the original language? How accurate is your translation? And how much of the book claims to be quotes of God? Well, I, I disagree with the premise. Not everything I know comes from this book. I know lots of things outside of the book. For instance, in this book, <coughs> it says, thou shalt not steal. It doesn't say in this book, Sai, that's your Grand Prix parked on the street up there. And that's not your car. I know lots of things outside of this book. What I'm saying is that you need this book in order to justify what you know. Not everything I've done that I know comes from here. I know lots of things outside of here. But you can't justify anything you claim to know unless you start with God. And the thing is, when, when Dan says that I exist is a necessary truth, first of all, he doesn't know that. And how does, you know, I say, well, how do you know you exist? You can't answer that question because that is also a circular argument. And, and there's um, Descartes who says, I think, therefore I am. And the syllogism there is I think. In order to think, I must exist, therefore I exist. But the conclusion to say I exist is assumed in the first premise, I think. How does he know that it's just not thoughts going through the ether that there is no existence? Without God, you can't even make sense of your own existence. He says it's a necessary truth. I deny that. For the 55 seconds you got left, or anything you want to comment on translation? 55 seconds? Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll my thing. Yeah. Um, well, I would say that the way that you know it's true is by reading it. 
That's how you know scripture is true. You have to read it in order to know that it's true. God reveals things to us through his word by reading it. And sure, it's the original autograph, which we say is infallible. But there are so many translations that we can go to God's word. Like James White, for instance, says that it's not that we have 90% of the Bible, and that's why we can know things. We have 110%. And with those different translations, we can look at them, and we do what's called exegesis. Use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And that's how you come to know. But if you want to know what's true, read it. And the essentials in all the translations are the same. That we're sinners and we deserve help. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for the price those who accept him, those who receive him. If I understood Sy correctly, he said, I exist is not a necessary truth. Am I correct in that? Yep. My question is, what's the alternative? The alternative is that there's brain thought going around and there is no existence. <laughs> okay, I don't know where that takes us, but... I think it's pretty clear that I exist as a necessary truth because if you do not exist and you to have no thoughts, you start from nothing. But I think that's really the crux of the matter. It's what the whole idea of the presupposition is what he's doing is he's calling these necessary truths, which are admittedly self referential, he's calling them viciously circular. Now, using the term vicious, I don't know what that brings to the party, but. Uh, they, they, they do, they are self-referential only because there's no alternative to that starting point. What, what Sai is doing is trying to get outside of that circle, if you would, of self-referentialism to a second circle in that God is the starting point. But the problem is he's also saying that he knows this God without providing a justification. At least I'm, in, at least I'm internally consistent in saying that my... Uh, axioms, if you would, I'm not making a knowledge claim. They're necessarily true. Science so making a knowledge claim without providing the justifications for the God. And the problem is, by his own admission, on his website it says, it, uh, on the idea of the Trinity, that it's not a comprehensible pro uh, concept. So it's incoherent, contradictory, and incomprehensible is the starting point from which he starts. I'm just starting from the necessary truths. So. I mean, you can ask yourself, who has the solid foundation from which to start? This question is for you, Dan. It's, uh, why should I accept atheism as true when you yourself admit that you could be wrong? Well, first let me define atheism. Athe atheism is just a negation of theism. And what I'm saying is there's not sufficient reason uh, to believe that a theist God is an actual entity exists apart from reality. So that's all the atheism is. We're not making a positive claim uh, of some existence. We're just saying there's not sufficient evidence for uh, theism. Uh, to exist. Can you read the second part of that again? <coughs> Why should I accept the atheism as true when you yourself admit that you could be wrong? But what I admit could be, I could be wrong about, that anybody could be wrong about, again, is the knowledge Claims. Those things that are based upon evidence we take in through our senses. Now we can be very, very confident of those. For the example I gave was gravity. I'm very confident, again, that gravity is going to work when I walk out of here today. But I cannot be absolutely certain because that would be a contradiction. So the knowledge part, I can be wrong about. The axioms, those necessary truths, I exist, or the law of contradiction, for example, are necessarily true, and therefore I cannot be wrong about them. Is Dan certain that you can't be certain? It's self-refuting to claim that you can't be certain. Um, if you can be wrong about everything you claim to know, you can't know that I exist as a necessary truth. Dan can be wrong about that. What it comes down to is that there are people in psychiatric hospitals whose reasoning is invalid. And if I were to ask Dan, how do you know you're not one of those people? You wouldn't be able to tell it because he'd be assuming that his reasoning is valid. Now, one thing I want to address quickly is that he says that atheism is not making a positive claim, it's just a lack of belief. That's right, it's a lack of belief in God, but they do make a positive claim that I can know things without God, that I can have truth without God, that I can have morality without God. Those are implied positive claims of atheism.
And you can see tonight that if you can be wrong about everything you claim to know, you can't know anything. And he's making, making a positive claim that he can know things without God. And I say he can't even know that he exists. But even if I granted him that, what else can he know? Nothing. Let me just address that real quickly. You know, I wish I had gotten this question during the question period. Uh, you know, how can you know that for certain? Uh, or how can I know that I exist? That's, again, that's the maneuver. That's the uh, intellectual uh, sleight of hand that I, I talked about. When he says certain, he's talking about absolute knowledge. And when I say, for example, that I exist or the foundation for everything that, that, that follows, I am not making a knowledge claim. It's a necessary truth. It's not a justified true belief. It's a necessary truth. So he keeps asking that question over and over again in different ways, trying to say, how do you justify the basis from which you build all knowledge? I'm not making a knowledge claim. It's a necessary truth. That's the important thing to look at. Do you know that it's a necessary truth then? I'm not making a knowledge claim. Do you know that you're not making a knowledge claim then? I'm not making a knowledge claim. And every okay. time he uses the word no, he's trying to pull the rabbit out of the hat. Do you know that you're not making a knowledge claim? I'm on to the trick. <laughs> you know that you're on to the trick. See, these are knowledge claims. He'd be wrong with everything he claims to know. That's why I actually like doing the interaction a little bit more than the question, because that's when you can see the absurdity of the view. When he says, I'm not making a knowledge claim, I say, do you know that? I'm not making a knowledge claim. This has to repeat that. You want to see the parlor trick, don't look at this side of the table. Sorry. Fear of God is exactly opposite of what I thought God stands for. You preach fear, not love. I refuse to live this life in fear. I have but one life to live here and now. This isn't a question, but it's a comment. Yeah. Well, this. that's fine. Like I say, but the thing is, the fear that we have of God is a respect. It's a respect we have of God. And that's because we know Him, because Christ died for our sins. However, the fear that the unbeliever has of God should be a tremble. It should be a tremble. So that will apply to those who reject Him. The thing is, if you want to live your life rejecting Him, fine. You can do that. I wouldn't recommend it. I think what the question is getting to is uh, you know, back, in, back to the sense of morality. As an atheist, knowing that I have one life in which to influence the history of the universe, make things better for my kids and for everybody else, makes me value this time that I have. It's extremely valuable because it's the only time that I have. Now, if you're a Christian or another religious person that believes in an afterlife, where is your focus? Are you focusing on trying to get into that afterlife, that, that perfect uh, utopia that's promised for you? If you are, then you're by definition devaluing the life that you have here and now, the one that you can know that you have, or at least be certain about. On the other hand, Look at what happened on 9-11. There were, what was it, 19 hijackers that were absolutely sure that they were getting into heaven to get their virgins and everything else that they were promised. Now, did they value their life? Did they value the, life, the lives of the people that they took? No, because their focus was entirely on the afterlife, that promise. That's why living your life now and valuing it and doing the best you can with that, like I said, you have a tool, the most powerful thing in the history of the universe, using it to make life better for everyone. That's what's important right now. This question is for you, Dan. Uh, why is there so much objective, gratuitous evil in the world? That's a, that's a good question. There's evil because people have competing uh, motives and competing objectives. And if somebody gets in the way of another person's objective, then they very often revert, resort to violence to try to correct the situation. Now I think in general, the type of violence reduces well-being and therefore it's inherently immoral. But we are natural beings that have natural tendencies, and sometimes those tendencies conflict. <coughs> the, evil. the real question is, if there's evil in the world, 
and there's an all-knowing, all-powerful God, how could he possibly allow it to exist? That's the problem of evil that so many Christians have struggled with, for good reason. Because an all-knowing, all-powerful God, it, and all good, it's claimed as well, would not, could not, allow evil to exist. That's not the problem. The problem that Dan has is that without God, there's no such thing as evil. If there's no God, then we're just evolved protoplasm. And when what, what one bag of evolved primordial slime does to another bag of evolved primordial slime is totally irrelevant. In order to call anything evil, you need a standard of goodness. Dan has no standard of goodness because what he calls evil, the next person could call good. And he has no basis by which he, he says, he has an arbitrary standard, he says the well-being of people. Well, why do I have to adopt that standard? Why do I have to agree with his definition of well-being? Why can't I make something else up? Without an absolute standard, there's no such thing as evil. We've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, Sai, how does believing a single God not limit your understanding of the universe when your answer for it is as simple as God did it? How does that not limit my understanding? Because it's true. Somebody were to say to me, how does you know saying that the answer to 2 plus 2 in base 10 mathematics is 4, how does that not limit your understanding? Well, because the answer is true. It's not God of the gaps when the answer is true. And the thing is, when you start there, then you can make sense of science. Then you can make sense of all these things. It's not that Christians dis dispute evidence or science. That God has given us these things as a gift to explore his world. But none of those make sense unless you start with God. That's why I encourage people to do science. Look at evidence. Evidence, you know, we don't say that there is no evidence for God. Evidence is for Christians. Because that same evidence we're going to examine according to our respective presupposition, I can say, look at that. That is evidence of God. And the atheist is going to say, no, that's evidence of evolution. But the thing is, you cannot make sense of examining evidence, of knowing anything to be true, unless you start with God. To understand the universe, one thing that's really important, and where one of the foundations for science, an axiom of science, as it were, is the uniformity of nature. The certain laws that the universe operates by. And having those as axiomatic allows us to uh, work from a uniform set of laws, if you would, such that we know that the universe will operate the same today as it will tomorrow. The problem with the Christian view is if God is in charge of ensuring all of those laws are uniform and consistent, then the very fact that he can perform miracles and upset those laws and deviate from those laws undermines our ba very basis of knowing anything. If we were doing an experiment and we got the same results over and over and over again and then all of a sudden we got a different result, how would we know whether or not this was God performing a miracle or there was an error in the experiment itself? You wouldn't know. It, the, the idea of God performing miracles undermines the very basis for knowing anything. That's the problem. Or in the scientific view, the uniformity standard, it's an axiom. It's a necessary truth for intelligibility of anything. So it must be, it's a necessary truth. It has to be that way. This will be the last question. Um, this is for Dan. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. It's like, it looks like a three-part question, but all tied together. Is Jesus wrong? How do you know? And could it be true? You know, actually, in a sense, I agree with that statement. If you say Jesus is truth, I agree if Jesus, God, are a metaphor for reality or for perfect knowledge, then what do we seek? What does the Christian seek? To be in the presence of God? To be in the presence of Jesus? Sure. That's a metaphor for perfect knowledge. Isn't that what we all seek? 
So in that sense, I agree with that statement, but, it had, but Jesus doesn't have to be anything more than a metaphor for truth or reality. And the question is, how do I know? I think I just explained that. And what was the last part, the, the truth? Could it be true? Could it, could it be true? Again, in a sense, it's true, but you never have to go outside of the idea of God and Jesus being a metaphor for reality. It's all of that other stuff that makes it the Christian God, the Bible, that I listed in my opening statement. That's all of those stuff that's unjustified. You never have to go there. In fact, that in itself is completely unjustified. So yeah, I can say it's true, in a sense, if you look at it as a metaphor for reality. Well, again, without God, you can't know anything. This debate was over when I asked Dan that one question, can you be wrong about everything he thinks? And I said yes. And once he says that, you can challenge every one of those knowledge. And one of the things he says is that, well, it's an axiom that the world won't change. How do you know your axiom won't change? How do you know you have the right axiom? Unless you start with God, you cannot make sense of that. And uh, there's, there's one thing that I, you know, I want to say to people. I've met a lot of atheists who've become Christians over the years. And when I ask them the question, did you know all along that God existed? You know, I'm saying, that, that's not my argument, but every one of them says, of course I do. No atheist becomes a Christian and says, well, what do you know? There is a God. No atheist becomes a Christian and says, well, what do you know? There is a God. They're always professing what they've known all along. And the thing is, I don't know if there's any of those atheists in this crowd who have that voice, you know, that's telling them that they know. I, I don't know if there's any of you out there. But if there is, I urge you to come and talk to John, to talk to one of us, or contact one of us. Because I know that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And if some of you out there who are his sheep, please come to us, talk to us about this, because this is important. This isn't only a matter of life and death in the here and now. It's a matter of life and death forever. It's where you're going to spend eternity. And, and don't give it up on, on your thrill-seeking, you know, whatever you want to do in this life. Don't give it up on that, because it's eternity. And you have no idea how long eternity is. Those who go to health really choose it. And like I said, I'd recommend that you don't do that. And I thank you again for your time. And like I say, if any of you want to talk afterwards, I'd be happy to address you. And I 